radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, all right. Good evening, Fade to Black. Today is Wednesday, September 6, 2023. Very excited about this show tonight. We have Pat O'Connell with us. Very excited about it. We are going to talk about the strange case of Clay Wheeler. Now, if you haven't heard of the strange case of Clay Wheeler, you're going to find out about it tonight. This is a case that uh, has fascinated me since it first broke. And uh, tonight is the night. You are going to hear all about it. Now, you can support the show. We broadcast four nights a week. We do four days of news each week. Uh, do the stuff with Christina Gomez, our team here, right? Help support everything that we do by just getting a Fade to Black t-shirt. Autographed, includes shipping. Uh, you can get it with a Game Changer uh, membership, or you can just order a t-shirt. We have two. We have the new one, the official Fade or Not shirt. We have the original shirt. And by the way, I was supposed to uh, send a, an original shirt out to somebody that specifically requested one. Um, uh, there's there's a story behind that. I sent the official Fade or Not shirt. I got the email today. I was like, man, what do you mean? Here's your tracking information. Then sent me a picture. I sent the wrong shirt. <laughs> uh, you gotta love it so that lucky fade or not who may be in the chat room tonight is going to have the full complete set i'm just going to ship out an original shirt to him tomorrow and uh you know on the house my mistake so now he's got a complete set um i, I wanted to say this before i get uh pat in here um uh there i've got i've got a setup here in the studio that uh, is is pretty cool, all right? You've all seen the studio. But in 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 the back, in the corner over here, I've got a, a, a big subwoofer, right? To get the subwoofer wired in, right, a separate feed goes into a submixer and then out to the uh, uh, subwoofer, right? Sounds great and, and, and stuff. But... This weird thing started about a month ago, and it took me a while to figure it out. But th this is what I started to hear in my monitors, a heartbeat. You know, and, I, and I'm just, where's that coming from? And I'm checking the wiring and this and going through, and I'm ground lifting the, the AC, and it just, just quite rewired. It's a heartbeat. And I couldn't figure it out. And it turns out that, and I'm bringing it up because I had to move it again. The sub, the mixer that powers, that feeds the subwoofer is sitting next to my Wi Fi router. And I, I just happened to move. It was just driving me nuts. And I was, moving cables around and I moved the mixer and it stopped. So the mixer, so now the mixer, which was sitting on my desk, sits on a little uh, cardboard box. It's raised up. Uh, that got rid of most of it. And then I have to move it like a half inch. As soon as I, it's a heartbeat. It's just crazy Wi-Fi heartbeat. And then I have to move. So right before the show, you guys have never heard it, but right before the show, boom, boom. I'm like, oh man, I had to just say it was like a quarter of an inch. And then it, it, it and it's weird. And I just have to move it around the Wi Fi. There's nothing else I can do about it. And it's and anyway, anyway. So that's, that's my little heartbeat story. When it first started, though, I, I was like freaked out. Like, I thought it was like, 
some Edgar Allan Poe book, you know, and uh, some story, you know, with the heartbeat going on. It, it really freaked me out. I couldn't. And that's exactly what it sounds like. Boom, 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 boom. Anyway, so I thought I'd share that with you because right before showtime, I had to lose the heartbeat. Tonight, Pat O'Connell is with us. We are going to be discussing the three years that a Texas aircraft repair shop uh, and its owner, Clay Wheeler, witnessed an array of paranormal phenomena and uh, its location and everything else. We'll discuss that during the show tonight and do the big uh, reveal on what this may be, because it could be aliens, could be ET, could be contact. Uh, there was poltergeist activity. With the poltergeist activity, was it was it ET? Was it something else? Was it demons? Uh, was it a psychotic break? Is it is it the movie The Shining for real? I don't know. It's a fascinating case. Pat has got a book out about it as well. We will discuss that. And her website is experiencers, with an X, experiencers.com. And I would like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black, Pat O'Connell. And there she is right there from the great state of Texas. Good evening, Pat. Final- Good evening, Jimmy. Yes. <laughs> Good My to man. see you. Yeah, yeah, it's, this is this is going to be great, and it is. I've been, it's going to be fun. I've been following you guys uh, for a while, and uh, I want I, I want to do a deep dive into this case. Okay. And you had asked me uh, before the show, um, you know, what I knew about it, and and and, and you he said, "Does the audience know?" I said, that's the point, right? That's the, I hope yeah. they don't, right? I hope you've <laughs> never heard of this case. If you've heard of the case, um, I, if you've heard of the case, you certainly um, had some, what do I want to, uh, maybe, maybe some bad dreams. I mean, because yeah. this is, it, 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 it's, it's, it's the stuff that nightmares are made of and, and the trauma that Clay went through. And for years, man, just yeah. it, it's just a crazy, crazy case. So, yeah. but let's get into your background a little bit. Um, I know th- you through your organization, Experiencers. Um, mm-hmm. And now, uh, so tell us about that. And, and of course, your brother, Jim. Well, uh, Jim was, um, he believed, he, this was my youngest brother, and he believed he had been, abducted by aliens. Now he was having crazy dreams for years and just wrote them. He thought he was having dreams. And after several years, uh, somebody said, well, what if they're not dreams? What if these crazy things are really happening? And it took him a while to actually come to this, I don't know, reckoning that he was being abducted. And he had other confirming experiences where other people were abducted at the same time. And he had no other way of knowing who they were. And he goes to a conference, a UFO conference, and he recognizes somebody that he met before in a spaceship. So, you know, this was a crazy thing that he went through. And so he, over over the years, he started um, talking to other experiencers and he realized that they were having even if it was like you say, a psychotic break, even if it was some kind of uh, psychological phenomenon uh, and didn't really happen, this was a real thing that was affecting their lives. It was affecting their relationships. People didn't believe them. They thought they were crazy. So he was, he wanted to reach out to these people. And then over time he, he thought, you know, there are all these shows about UFOs on TV, but there's no show about the experiencers and what they're going through and, and, uh, really at the time there were, you know, he was kind of comparing it to the, uh, the ghost shows where they're out looking for evidence of a ghost. Whereas there was one show that actually seemed to care about the people who were experiencing these things and their emotional experience. And he wanted to do the equivalent of that for the uh, UFO experiencers, the ones who had been abducted. And so he was developing a, uh, a reality show called Experiencers. And um, so he came across this one case, which was Clay Wheeler's case. And um, 
he called me and he said, you know, I've got this case that's just, I can't believe how big it is. It, there's just so much going on. Um, I couldn't possibly cover it in one episode, one, one hour episode, or even let's say a three episode arc. Um, so he knew I was a writer. Uh, he was in Connecticut. I'm here in Texas and it took place in Texas. And so he asked, you know, would I be interested in a vetting this guy? You know, is he for real? Is he, you know, off the rails? And, uh, also, would I be interested potentially in writing a book or multiple books or screenplays or all of the above uh, to cover all, the whole scope of this? And I'm like, well, yeah, that sounds interesting. And then he said, the guy says he's killed and buried an alien. And I'm like, holy cow, I'm in. <laughs> I'm so in. Yeah, and, as, as if there wasn't enough involved right. in this case, right? And then you right. throw that in because there's all there's everything else. But the, the main uh, oh, the, there's a lot of main things here, uh, main points. But this <laughs> spanned three years. Yeah, uh, daily, nightly occurrences, uh, contact experiences, visions, uh, craft, and things in the sky, things outside. He's got, uh, uh, we'll get into Clay specifically in a second, but he's got uh, an aircraft airplane repair shop out, right. out at this airport. And, you know, I, I mentioned The Shining earlier uh, <laughs> when, I, when I brought this up. You know, uh, you're, you're alone working late you know, in your, in your shop, you've got employees and stuff, but you, you're right. spending so much time there. Um, and airports, this isn't, this isn't O'Hare airport. This is right. a small County airport, which they're basically empty, right? Yeah. There's, there's nobody there. And, and so all of this develops over three years and you can lose your mind. Right. You could really, I, I just can't imagine what Clay went through. And so your right. brother's w was and is correct. You can't put that in one episode or two episodes. That's exactly. A, it's like three seasons, actually. <laughs> There's so much material left on the cutting room floor that I couldn't put in the book. So, you know, what do I do with all the rest of that? And obviously there will be another book, but um, just just incredible the amount of things that happen and the weird thing the weird thing <laughs> that's a dumb yeah, thing to say for this thing, story yeah. but he had been working at the airport and living at the airport for years before 2010 it didn't start until 2010 that's another one of the mysteries we're hoping to find out you know what did something happen in 2019 that kicked off this series of events um, maybe not, but we're, you know, we're, we're hoping to find out more about the history of the land and, you know, are there, get sensors out there and find out if there are weird gases or radiation or who knows what. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And now let's, okay, so now, now, now that we've set that stage, um, let's, let's, let's back up and, and start at the beginning. Um, and who, who was Clay? W uh, by the way, um, uh, I'm just going to say this out front, Clay and your brother, Jim have left this beautiful blue planet. They're, they yes. are no longer with us. Um, and they, hey, can I, okay. You know what? It's just you and I, Pat. So I'm just going to talk, <laughs> just, just going to talk to you straight. They died very close together. And I, that uh, is, it feels a little strange to me. And well, not, imagine it, being it, me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right? <laughs> you and, know, and I'm picking so, up the story. So, and, and I don't know if it has anything to do with the case or not, but it's no. just one other uh, piece of strangeness uh, to add to this uh, amazing case. So let's start with uh, who, who was Clay Wheeler? Well, uh, Clay was uh, just this very ambitious, creative um, he was brilliant mechanically. He, he just was really good at, uh, making machines and repairing aircraft and, uh, um, you know, everything was going fine. He was building up the business. He was married to, I think his third wife, I'm not sure. Uh, 
And, you know, everything was going well. He's building up the business. He has more and more employees uh, trying to get more contracts um, to repair and maintain these various craft, uh, the aircraft. And um, so, you know, everything was going well until uh, one night some people came out to the airport in the middle of the night and uh, and he had no interest in UFOs or anything like that. He, he had interest in uh, buying nice cars and motorcycles and going on nice trips and, you know, those kinds of things, kind of materialistic things, which he said changed throughout the course of this whole thing. Uh, his priorities changed. But uh, middle of the night, um, there were some people he heard talking out on the runway and he goes out and turns out they were following this light that was behaving unusually in the sky. And so they kind of followed it from town out to the airport and he goes out and he's looking at it with them. And then he said that he got in his truck and, and tried to follow it farther away. Uh, and that was really the beginning of it. He started watching the skies for unusual things. And um, at first he would go out at night and um, play laser tag with these lights, you know, and he, he was a pilot, he was a flight instructor, he repaired aircraft, he knew what was normal and was what wasn't normal. And um, so he's out there shining lasers in the sky, which you can't do now, but um, in those days you could. And so he noticed that sometimes he could play the lasers and these craft, these lights, it was just a light in the sky, but they would jump in ways that aircraft can't do. Um, and so, you know, he thought, well, this is unusual. There's some, something else is going on. And then um, at one point he had done a, uh, his crew had done a repair on a wing of a plane and they had it out on the, on the apron uh, outside the hangar. And uh, he needed to take some pictures of the repairs for the insurance company, for the client's insurance company. So he's underneath, he takes these pictures and he goes back into the computer and he uploads the pictures to the computer and he sees what looked like a silver pork pie hat in the sky. Now this was not a dot of light. And this is one of the things that bugs me. I'm a skeptic. So when people say, you know, I saw this UFO. Well, was it a dot in the sky? You know, and a lot of times it is. Uh, a lot of times it's a, a planet and they say, oh, this thing hovered and uh, for several hours and then it finally <laughs> slowly disappeared. I'm like, no, it was Venus and it set. Um, but so he he saw this thing and it there's no denying what it was. I mean, it was it was a UFO. But here he is his whole livelihood depends on the FAA. And, you know, it's like fight club. You, you know, you don't talk about fight club. You don't talk about UFOs to, you know, if you work for the FAA or if your livelihood depends on the FAA. So um, he didn't say anything. And yeah. And so I, I, I just want to jump in because he, uh, back in the beginning, he talks about, uh, his knowledge of the airport and the perimeter fence and and everything that was going on there because he was there all day, uh, every day. He he knew the area. He knew aircraft. He knew what you know was exactly. being seen in the sky, and his feet were on the ground. He at that point. He was he was still a normie, right? <laughs> he was he still was, sane. <laughs> he was still sane, and 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 it, it was one of those things that uh, you know he said uh, in the very beginning when when he heard uh, them. I just want to circle back to this because when he heard them talking about the lights in the sky, and and he went outside. I think he described. I, I could have this wrong. Um, it's been a while, but blue lights. And then he jumps in his truck and he drives up the runway, right? And mm -hmm. and he goes the full length of the airport, uh, trying to chase this thing down and and get right. a closer look. So he, you know, he just knew the lay of the land. This was his world, right. and and suddenly it was disrupted uh, by by these lights and and finally a craft uh, was spotted. Exactly that first craft that he got a photograph of. And, uh, you know, and then he went out and took some more pictures to make sure, you know, he wasn't 
losing his mind or it was a, you know, a, a glob on the, he th at first he thought it was a, some kind of a, a dirt on the lens of the camera. Uh, and so he went back out and he took another picture, but there was no similar thing on the, on the next picture. So it was clearly a real object in the sky. So that was, that was kind of his, his baptism into this whole UFO thing. And he kept it to himself because he did, he didn't want to say anything to his employees. Um, he certainly didn't want to admit it to anybody else. Um, so that's kind of where it started. And um, so, you know, he's playing laser tag. He, he, then he started seeing craft there. The, the first one was sort of a, he called it a soap bubble. It was like this giant, you know, you've seen an iridescent kind of soap bubble. It was it's something like that that came down onto the close to the runway. Um, and then another time he's out there playing laser tag with just a light in the sky that could be anything. And, and he's like, OK, that's fine. And and he quits doing that. He, I think the, the, the light disappeared behind some trees or something like that. And he's thinking, OK, well, show's over. I'm done for the night. And next thing he knows, this big ship comes in, not like mothership. He had a mothership at one point, but this big ship, bigger ship, maybe 30 feet in diameter, comes down, hovering over the runway, and he was scared to death. And he was thinking, you know, the, the light that he was playing with was like the kid ship, and the, the big one was the dad ship kind of coming down and saying, yeah, don't mess with my kid. And, uh, you know, he's kind of standing there trying not to move and trying to communicate with it. And, you know, he, he doesn't really know what's going to happen. He's thinking this thing could kill me. And that was uh, and he's alone. He's alone. He is he's absolutely alone. alone. He yes. is alone at night at this, you know, this massive airport, big piece of property. Right. And, and 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 this this incident happens and he uh, he he freaks out. And I, I, I can't blame him for that. Um, you you want to have somebody with you. right? <laughs> you don't want to really? be alone when this goes down. And, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah. And he tried to get his wife to come out. He saw uh, I'm trying to think which thing it was that he was seeing. And he tried to get her to come out. And, he, you know, he says, you got to come out and see this. And she says, I'll just shoot it. She's she's thinking there's an animal out there that he wants her to come see. And he's like, no. And so she just goes to bed. And then this thing goes away. And, of course, she doesn't believe him until some time passes. They go to the uh, they go to the grocery store. This is actually farther into the story. But um, when she there were a lot of behavioral changes that happened. We don't know why, uh, but she, they go to the grocery store. They're coming back from the store and on the top of the hanger, there's an egg shaped craft and a little kind of a stick figure looking guy. It's from a distance and it, the sun was going down. So uh, they couldn't really get a good look at it, but they see this stick figure kind of, uh, you know, panic and run toward the egg shaped thing and jump kind of dies into the egg shaped thing as it's, kind of taking off and finally that was when she saw something but before that she was just like oh he's just doing his ufo thing like it was a you know golfing or <laughs> some kind of hobby you know and uh, so she was writing all that off as if he was imagining things or uh, misinterpreting things and of course maybe he was that's one of the he, he he describes uh, okay so this uh, you said stick figure um, and and I don't want to get too far ahead of our skis here yeah. because he sees a lot of different uh, uh, right. entities or beings and stuff but uh, that when he sees the the egg shaped craft uh, on the on the on the roof with with the alien. He describes uh, over the years a lot of contact with with what I would say are grays, your typical yes. type of gray. Yes. Is, is this what he saw that night? Is that how he described it? No. No, this was more um, tall and slender. 
Uh, now, maybe it would be, maybe you could describe that as the kind of gray that some people have seen, but the, the grays that he mostly had encounters with were smaller. So they were more like child size. Um, this was more tall, slender, um, and he couldn't really get any detail. And there was another incident he had where uh, they were like black clothespin figures that were at a distance. So again, he couldn't see any detail. So that could have been the same. It could have been the same creatures, same, same kind of creatures. Um, but again, it wasn't close enough to get to see anything uh, now, clearly. Uh, what, and, and what happened next? Um, and it, I know that uh, I, I just asked you what happened next and, and then didn't <laughs> allow you to. But but he he starts uh, again. This is over three years, but this is in the very beginning, right? And and I I I believe I could have this wrong. Uh, it's I've it's been uh, I've been with this case for so many years now, but he had like a loft area inside of the uh, repair shop. And he would spend time in his office there, and he started to hear things outside when there was um, nobody at the airport. I don't think it was a loft. The the way I now I have not seen inside the airport uh, the hangar because when we went out there with him, it didn't belong to him anymore, and the person who owned it wasn't right, there, so right. we couldn't get in. Um, but um, the way I understood it was that it was like a the hangar and then an office and then he built an apartment on the other end. So the office That's was, what it was right, between. right, right, and right. And right, there was right, a, right, a, right. a, like a bulletproof window between the hangar and the office. So that, you know, from the office, he could see what was going on in the hangar and that sort of thing. Right. So, right. Uh, but yes. Um, and that's actually one of those things that ended up on the cutting room floor that I didn't talk about in the book. So it, I'm glad that you mentioned that uh, he was hearing things he heard, uh, it sounded like something going on underground. Yep. Um, and I think, I th think there were two different kinds of sounds that he was hearing and, and you brought it up. I have not thought about this in a long time, so I can't really clarify that, but um, I'm glad you reminded me though. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's hearing stuff at night and he's going outside and, and looking right. around and uh, going up in, uh, in the fence line and, and right. it was constantly hearing things when, and the point that um, I'm trying to make here is that he, he knew what was, what used to be. Right. And suddenly right. now everything is right. just completely different. And exactly. the airport was quiet. There was nothing going on. And now all of a sudden stuff is stuff is happening around him and he doesn't understand right. what is going on. Right. And he set up a security system uh, with a with a camera. And so a lot of stuff that came later. What he saw on the security camera monitor. So like, oh, I know the, the thing that his wife finally saw uh, on the security camera that she kind of wrote off the night before, um, there were multiple, he said they were, uh, this is the second, the, this was actually the first event that had egg-shaped craft. And there were multiples of these egg-shaped craft with the pointy end down. And um, they had like, he said it was like, arms or some kind of appendage sticking out from the side and and these appendages were dropping like blue sparklers and they were dropping into the ground and it was like over the runway and so you know he he, he showed it to his wife and she's she, she this was the next day so she had written it off the night before the next day she sees it on the security camera and she's like wow so she believed him then uh but it was like what what's up with these blue sparklers? So he goes out to the runway and tries to find out, you know, is there some, are there burn marks on the pavement? You know, um, is there any evidence that these things were even there? And there wasn't, I mean, there were, there were craft that would fly. There, he saw conventional saucer shaped craft that would go up into the air and dive into the ground 
And he'd go and look at the runway or the ground where they went, supposedly went into. And he says, there's no disturbances. There's no way this thing went into the ground. And yet there have been since then, uh, and even after he moved away, people reporting craft or lights that behaved strangely and then dove into the ground, disappeared, no evidence of it. Now, it, it, it's going to come up, so let's just go ahead and, and, and put this out there now. Uh, the location of the airport is in Texas, yes. but we're not going to talk about uh, specifically the location because there's an ongoing investigation going on right. out there, and uh, uh, we just don't need you know, uh, a scene from Independence Day and, you know, 300 RVs, uh, you know, pull up. Right. And the there, and there's a certain element of danger that people could be in that we don't want, um, you know, we don't want anything bad happening to people. So, you know, our team is, uh, you know, have the, have the experts to do what we're doing to investigate safely. So, um, you know, hopefully, Sometime soon, maybe next year or something, we'll be able to to tell everybody what's going on, what we learned. So, now, uh, what year are we? Uh, uh, did all of this start? Started in 2010. 2010, and yeah. so we're we're still in the first month of 2010 right now, yeah. right? In 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 the story, it's it's three years uh, again uh, that uh, this case uh, occurred over. Right. Um, and when, uh, at what point does it go from, you know, lights in the sky, stuff on the security camera to, to uh, a close encounter? Uh, gosh. Um, well, really, the, the close encounter happened after his wife uh, had moved away from the airport. And before that happened some really crazy stuff happened with her. So um, his encounter with um, the close encounters with aliens are probably in 2011 or 2012, probably, probably 2011. So, um, and so before that, he noticed that when people, pe people would, their, their moods would change when they, like the, his employees, when they'd clock in, um, they'd go dark. They would be angry and, um, you know, complaining. And, and when they'd get out of the airport, they were fine. Uh, but the weirdest changes were with his wife. And she, in the beginning, was just very sweet and almost prim. Um, and as time went on, um, she, her behavior, just went off the rails. And uh, the first encounter I want to say was um, she, she, she was mad at him because she was jealous. There was a thing where she thought, I don't know, she was jealous of his secretary or one of the, he had a female employee. Uh, it was pretty irrational, uh, but she was mad. And he uh, took her out to dinner uh, to try to calm her down and say, you know, there's nothing to worry about. And she storms out and he's trying to stop her from driving away mad. And she slams his hand in her, in the door of her truck and drags him for like a mile and a half. And by the time she opens the door and lets him loose to go skidding across the road, um, you know, he's broken several ribs. He's, I know he had, he was in he he was in three casts. I think it was both arms and one leg, um, and so he was a mess for quite a while. And uh, and then another time, uh, she 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 woke up and she looked like she was eight months pregnant, and he was like freaking out. I mean, the, the, is this some kind of tumor? I mean, I need to get you to the doctor. And she was she was angry again, and she uh, she she's he, he's kind of chasing her around the living room, trying to get her to take her to the doctor. And finally, she jumps up on the couch and she's like 
trying to trying to say, okay, okay, I'll 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 go. And when he gets close enough, she kicks him in the head, knocks him on the on the tile floor, knocks him out. And when he comes to, she's gone. And when she comes back, oh yeah, and that that morning he caught her eating raw hamburger, which you know, pregnant woman you know, might do, but she wasn't pregnant and it doesn't just pop up overnight. So she comes back like five hours later, no belly, it's flat. So that was another one of those weird encounters. And then the kind of the final thing was she shows up at the shop, at the airport, at the hangar uh, with a 45 and she starts shooting. She's shooting it. I mean, it, nobody got hurt because I guess she was a bad shot, but she just emptied a revolver at these people and uh, they had to call the police on her. So at that point, he finally, you know, he kept making excuses for making excuses for. And this was the final straw and he got divorced. So it wasn't until after the divorce that he really had his first close encounter with aliens. So he's there by himself now. So you were talking about this feeling of being in this place all by yourself. This it's the shining. It's the shining, man. It's a yeah. Stephen, it's the yeah. it's a Stephen King book. Yeah, if it if it For you know, real, you add though. some add some snow and you've got the <laughs> yes, shining. Yeah. Yes, 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 and yes. So now he's out here by himself. And um so I told you about the when when she dragged him from her truck. This was kind of part of the beginning of his health problems. Uh, he was he was starting to get sicker and more damaged, and of course, you know, he was in the hospital for a while, you know, for these various injuries, and then he was on drugs to take care of things. But he just kept getting sicker and sicker. And so, um, anyway, so. As time goes on, this is this trend is happening. So um, now she's gone. She's not at the apartment anymore. And so at night, he's there by himself. And and so a lot of times during the day, he's there by himself. Uh, what if it was a weekend? If you know if they weren't working. Um, so he's he's in his apartment, and he wakes up around three o'clock in the morning, and he, you know, kind of looking out the window, looking at the security monitor to see if anything's going on. Cause by now he's, he's fascinated with the idea that there are craft, there are aliens. He wants to get to know them, that sort of thing. And so, um, you know, he's, he's up and so he's, he decides, okay, well, I'm going to call my sister. She's that's right. She's, that's right. This is nuts. Yeah. 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 She's yeah, yeah. working. Oh, yeah. She's working in China. So it's middle of the day for her. Uh, so he's going to call and check up on his sister. So he's talking to his sister and he's kind of an ADD, antsy kind of uh, restless guy. So he's talking on the phone. And as he's talking, he kind of just walks over to the door from the that goes from the apartment into the office and just absently just grabs the doorknob and he opens it. And as he opens the door, he sees two little gray aliens on the left. And he said, and this whole, this whole experience happened in just a few seconds, but it was so profound that it was etched in his memory. But he describes these two little aliens. Uh, he said they, they were in like silver, not jumpsuits, but he said it was like a two piece outfit. <laughs> and he said they were wearing boots that to him look like ropers, you know, and if you're, if you're a Texan, you know, that's just plain vanilla cowboy boots. They're not fancy, no carving on them, no pointy toes, nothing like that. They're just work boots. And, uh, but he said they look like they were spray painted silver. But the weird thing about the two little grays was that when he, as he opened the door, the grays moved out of the way, like they were joined, like a gate. He said it was like opening a gate. The two of them were together. And that's a detail that who would make that up? Right. You know? Right. And being a skeptic, I'm looking for those little cues. And so he, he saw that happen. And that, that really kind of burned into his memory. And then he looks to his right 
And there's this tall, tan alien. And it appears to be naked, but he said there were no, he said there were no Gentiles, but he meant genitals. Um, there were no, I, I say it's, it was like a Ken doll. You know, it was just like, a plain body with no distinguishing features, but the head he said was, uh, it was a big head and the eyes were bulging out. So like baseballs in a socket, that's too small for the, for the eyes and that the lids closed top to bottom. And he said in the back, the back of the head bulged with like these two bulges. Um, and he said, I knew right away, that that was the bodyguard for the two graves. And he said, and that big guy took kind of lurched forward and I backed out and I, he said, I dropped the phone and I closed the door and I didn't look back for several hours. That's right. Alone, alone, yeah. alone, 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 alone. alone. Alone, and alone. I mean, what do you what do you do? I mean, how long do you wait to look back in there? Yeah, he, he, you know, <laughs> really? uh, you know? he did. He did what I would have done. Yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't have gone back um, and every night um, when I when I go upstairs, you know, I, I, you know it, it's bedtime. Right. And I, I round the corner to go into my bedroom. Now I and now I've got two options there. First off, the room is dark. Okay, and immediately I'm thinking of Clay Wheeler here <laughs> oh, no. because this is this is I, I say this every single night. This is a personal thing, I'm gonna, and so when I round right there on the corner, there's a, a, a light switch for it's it's way up high, but there's a, a dome light at, at the top of the A frame in in the thing. It's way up high, and I can. Turn that on, and then I turn on the lamp. It's a touch lamp, right? Turn that on, then I turn around and turn off the big light. I said it last night. I say it every <laughs> night. One of these days, I'm going to walk in. Oh, I'm going to hit that light, and there's going to be something friggin' standing there. Right? <laughs> I know it. It's going to happen, man. I, I, it's just like I'm preparing yeah. myself for it. And 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 what to do now? Put yourself in Clay's shoes. Oh my God, I can't. Right? You you swing open that door. You've got a couple of aliens that that are hinged, right? And you've got uh, the bodyguard standing there. You're talking to your sister on the phone, right? And you you lose your mind. So right. yeah, you back away. You close the door and you stare at the door. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I ask myself, and I didn't ask him this question, and I regret it, but you know what? What may what allowed you to go and open that door again? And how long did it take before you were you felt okay to open that door? And 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 so <laughs> I don't mean to laugh because it's it's a frightening. You have to um, you have to protect your mental well being. Right. That's that's the thing. And when stuff like this starts going on, what you don't need is confirmation, because the right. confirmation, oh, oh, this is oh, oh, <laughs> then, then, then that's it. Then, then you're off to the funny farm, and you, you, you know, you're, you mentally, you want to keep yourself in check. That's why you don't go back and open up that door, right? Um, and and uh, that, and and being alone, you know, you have to wonder. At, at what point do do you take it? Is it taken too far? And I think yeah. this is this is one of the first nights uh, where where Clay went there. Yeah, and and for all I know, he waited until the sun came up, you know, before he opened the door because you know he knew that his his employees were going to show up at I think seven uh, in the morning for work and. <laughs> You know, they're coming in from the other direction. They're coming in from the hangar. And if there's anything in the office, they're going to see it. So now, um, he, now that's another point. Now, he stayed up all night uh, that night and and w w was waiting for his employees to show up. Uh, I can't imagine uh, as, as this is building up because he, now he has to work all day. And this right. is nothing to be, you know, and 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 you've got to cycle back through. The employees are going to leave, and you're alone again. 
Right. And 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 the the cycle starts. And is this going to be every night? Are they going to mm-hmm. show up somewhere else? Are they going to be, you know, you go into the bathroom. Are they going to be in the bathroom? You know, are they going to be in your kitchen? Um, y- one case, you don't know what that represents. Is it a pattern or is it a one-off? So uh, it turned out to be a one-off in a way, but he did see other uh, grays in the building. So, so what happens next? Oh, 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 I did it again. I did it again. <laughs> I know we're jumping what, around, but okay. you know, it, it's so much fun. This is such an amazing case. It, it's a, it's really fantastic story. When did your brother hear about it? Okay. It was, uh, uh, well, I got involved in 2015. So Jimmy must've gotten involved in 2014. Right. Right. As, uh, everything started to end. Well, he moved, Clay moved away from the airport in 2013, early 2013. Um, And actually, uh, you know, he was, he was getting so sick and the business had gone to hell because of all the crazy stuff that happened. And I don't know whether it was his idea or his mom insisted on getting him out of there. But um, in early 2013, he was done. And that's when he moved out. So uh, what happens next? So, um, all right. So he's got the, uh, you know, he's seen some of the aliens now. He's he's actually seen up close and personal these aliens. And um, so one day there's a, uh, uh, his, his business kind of, you know, it booms and it's doing really well. And then as the, the, activity, the strange activity peaks or rises, um, you know, the business starts to fall off or there's difficulties that eventually lead to losing business. So one day his uh, secretary tells him that, you know, we've, we've got some money problems, cash flow problems, and, you know, we, we can't make payroll. We, this one big job that we were supposed to get paid for, the client's not paying, uh, and the electric bill was a thousand dollars higher than usual. So Clay, being the only per- full-time resident at the airport, he paid the utilities uh, for you know, and it, that accounted for the runway lights and the terminal building, and as well as his hangar and the beacon, uh, you know, for the planes coming in at night and all that sort of thing. So you know, he's just feeling all of this bad stuff kind of coming in on him. And then one night he's looking at the security camera and he sees these, I don't want to call them horseshoe shape. The, the, they, they sounded to me like what Kenneth Arnold described. Kenneth Arnold being the pilot that saw the very first reported quote unquote flying saucers. And he didn't call them saucers. He said they skipped through the air like saucers, and that was the origin of the the term flying saucers. But the ship that he described, it was a disc, but it in his that it kind of had a, a slightly flatter back. But I've seen some others that had what Clay described as a bite out of the back. So almost a horseshoe shape. But they were hovering over the runway lights. And he said there were these creatures that seemed to be, he said it reminded him of an old gas station where you would have a a gas station attendant that would come out and wipe your wash, you know, wash your windshield and pump your gas and all that, check your oil. Uh, He said, and so there there were these little aliens that seemed to be servicing the craft that were hovering over the runway lights. And then there was this other guy that he, he called the Oreo cookie guy. And he said, this creature had a head like a giant Oreo cookie. And I asked him, how big was this guy? And he said, well, okay, the runway lights are about three feet off the ground. He said, so this guy would have been about 15 feet tall. And I'm like, holy cow. And he said, this head on him was so big, especially in comparison to the rest of his body. He said, this guy was like the supervisor and he would come over and he would like, bend over as if he's checking the work of the little guys. 
And Clay's thinking, how can this Oreo cookie guy not fall over from the weight of this unwieldy giant head? Um, but then, then, so he's, he's fascinated with this, right? And then he remembers that thousand dollars extra electric bill. And he's thinking, holy crap, these craft are refueling off of my runway lights. They're, they're drawing energy somehow or another off the runway lights. And then he got mad. So he goes and he gets a gun and he starts, to, you know, he starts trying to shoot at them. And that's the end of, of that particular episode. And of course he didn't hit anything. Um, because in a lot of cases he could see things, he could see these craft through, uh, an artificial lens, like, the security camera or through a camera or through a night vision scope, but he couldn't see them with the naked eye. So this was, this was a challenge for me as the investigator to find out how many of these things you're telling me you saw, did you see with the naked eye and how many were seen through a camera or, you know, the lens of a night vision goggles or whatever. So, um, how did he, how does he answer that? Like for instance, let's talk about this uh, this this repair episode with Oreo Cookie Guy. Right? Is, is that naked eye? Is no. he outside watching this, or is he well, watching this on the security camera? He's watching this on the security camera, and he goes out. and I'm trying to remember if that was one. I think I think he could see those with the naked eye once he got out there because he was he was shooting. I I think he shot at them. There was another instance where he could he could only see. I mean, he was out there and he could only see the ship through the scope on his rifle. And if he put that down, he there was nothing there. So those kinds of things happened. And so trying to separate the events where and and toward the end, I was really trying hard to nail down, did you see this with your own eyes? Did you see this with your unaided eyes? Um, or was this through the lens of something else? Um, because I think now, in some it, cases, like, and this is me being the skeptic, the investigator, right. um, I, w I, was trying to, I was trying to sort things that could be debunked that was, you know, let's say he, he took some video and he was misinterpreting uh, visual noise, you know, because he's shooting in the dark. And uh, maybe if it's too far beyond the, the building's security lights, um, you know, it's real grainy. And you can, uh, you know, it's a thing called pareidolia. Your listeners probably know what I'm talking about. It's pattern recognition. So you, you might see something in the, sh in the shades of gray and it moves and, um, you don't really know what it is, but you might interpret it in a certain way. So I was trying to separate those misinterpretations where he was, he was looking at a lot of things through camera lenses after a while. I mean, he was just rabid about trying to capture something on camera. So he had cameras everywhere. And a lot of times it was just a misinterpretation of patterns in, in the noise. And so I, I was trying really hard to push him to, to get him to tell me, did you see this with your, with the naked eye up close and personal, or was this through some other means, some mechanical means? So that became an issue for me as the investigator. Now it, it, it's, it's like heart of darkness, right? Where mm -hmm. you're just, you're, you're teetering on, uh, you know, the edge of sanity, right? Right. And right. I, I don't want to say insanity. You're on the edge of sanity here. Um, and again, you're spending, uh, you know, all of this alone time. Right. And I, there, there was obviously something going on. And there was movement right. and stuff. There was poltergeist activity. Um, and, and there was some serious contact going on. Um, it, you know, his wife, uh, Heart of Darkness, she yeah. loses it, the employees and, and everything else. And uh, your world is spiraling out of control and there's nothing right. you can do about it. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it, it was one thing after another. There was 
one night, um, I think before things got too bad, um, where he had several crew members, they were working late and there was this one craft that he saw that he called the eyeglass case. You know, it's like a hard shell eyeglass case, uh, shaped craft. And there were two instances with that same, I don't know if it was the same one, but it was, it looked the same. So the first instance they were, they were working late and he wanted to show people, he wanted to show the team how he could, he could get these craft to come in closer if he played with the lasers. So he's out there with the lasers and this craft, you know, he shoots the, the laser at it and this eyeglass case craft comes in closer and he shoots it again and it comes in closer. And, you know, he says to one of the guys, Oh, here, you want to try it? And he gives him the laser and the guy's like, no. So he takes the laser back and he does it again. And this craft comes right over, almost right over him. And he said, you know, they're all watching it. And he said, he started to feel like, um, like somebody had poured a bucket of water inside his head and it was kind of going down through his body. And, um, and then he got this monstrous headache. And so he called it the headache beam that this thing shot a headache beam. And this was like the worst headache he's ever had in his life. And, you know, his, his crew members are like, okay, I gotta, we got to get you out of here. So they rush him inside and uh, he, he, he was explaining it like he felt, and, and this is so cool. He felt like they were, he said, I, he said, I think they were trying to communicate with me. Um, and he said, I think the only way I can describe it is I think it's like what a computer must feel when it's downloading information. You know, and I'm, I'm like, that's such a cool concept that, a, first of all, that a computer would feel something, but the data coming in would feel like this hot water, warm water coming into it and, and flushing through him. And of course, one of his friends said, no, I think they were trying to kill you. Um, and we don't know. But so that was his first encounter with this eyeglass cape shape thing. And then like toward the end when almost everybody was, had quit and the business was almost dead and uh, he was there with just one other employee and um, they, they were going to grill chicken together for dinner because the guy's wife was out of town. And so um, he starts firing up the grill and his employee guy comes running in and says, there's, this that craft is hovering between the hangar and the uh, terminal building, and it and he goes out there, and this thing is hovering so low, he could reach up. He said, "I could reach up and touch the bottom of it with my hand." Now Clay Clay was a tall guy, and um, so I'm like, "Wow." What did that feel like? Did you did you ever get a chance to uh, speak with any of the employees or a secretary? No, uh, and those those are some weird stories. The only people I've really talked to are his sister and his mom. And uh, what about his wife? No, the last I heard, um, his wife had had a massive stroke, and um, that she uh, we didn't know if she was going to make it. So. Um, I don't know, but that's, those are all parts of this new investigation, trying to, hoping that we can track down witnesses. Cause he said there were a lot of witnesses. There were people who saw things, uh, you know, employees, even at the shop during the day. I mean, these, the, the, the saucer craft that were diving into the ground, he said that a lot of that happened during daylight. Um, Let's, uh, uh, I've, I've got to take a break. Let's get that in sure. now. And then when we come back, this Clay is now um, uh, at this point uh, sitting in his shop with loaded weapons, like 24 yes. seven. Yes. And that, and that, and, and what happens next, we're going to discuss that. And uh, this is uh, the crazy case of Clay Wheeler, our guest tonight, Pat O'Connell, and her book. You can go to experiencers.com, everybody. The link is below. 
and get yourself a copy of the book. We will be right back after this short break. Stay with us. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below. And we'll be right back. Join us November 10th, 11th, and 12th, 2023. Live at the Luxor Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip. As Disclosure Fest Foundation and Fade to Black Radio presents Stairway to the Stars, a human origins, science, and technology expo. With live talks, lectures, and workshops by world-acclaimed researchers and authors featuring topics like human origins, ancient technologies, indigenous teachings, workshops, a mass meditation, yoga and sound healing, music, and so much more. This is Jimmy Church, by the way, and I'll be your host all weekend long. Don't miss our intimate sky watch and meteor shower over the infamous Area 51 airspace in Rachel, Nevada, with special surprise celebrity host guiding us through the night. This event will sell out. For more information and tickets, please visit DisclosureFest.org. Hi, everybody. Jimmy Church here. Very special announcement, and that is we are shipping Fade to Black t-shirts again. It's been almost two years. We did a full upgrade to the website, so you can head over to JimmyChurchRadio.com. It's all simple to do, and it's right there. Remember... We broadcast four nights a week, Monday through Thursday. We bring you the best, the brightest, the most knowledgeable and amazing guests, the best conversations. We do that four nights a week. We also do four days a week. We broadcast the news, and we do that live, too, as well. It's not a one-man show. I do it with website support. I do it with producers. I do it with writers and artists. All contribute to the show. The best way to help support what we do here is with the Fade to Black t-shirt. And you can get your Fade to Black t-shirt one of two ways. First... Go to jimmychurchradio.com, order a shirt. It's really that simple. You're going to get a tracking number, it's going to get shipped, and it's going to get autographed. The second way to get a shirt is with a Game Changer membership. Now, the Game Changer membership not only includes a free t-shirt, but you get a private email to me. You get unlimited commercial-free downloads. You have full access to the website, and everything includes includes free shipping and everything is autographed. So help support the show. Get your fade to black t-shirt today. The links are below. You can just go to jimmychurchradio.com and it's right on the website. So there you go. I'm Jimmy Church, fade to black. I'm so excited that I just have one thing to say. Go back Lee Tappy. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right. Welcome back. Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Pat O'Connell. We're talking about the strange case of Clay Wheeler uh, that went on for three years, 2010, 11, 12, 13, um, somewhere in the great state of Texas at a county airport. And uh, at at this point, I'm going to do a quick reset here. Um, uh, we're about two years uh, into this, and and Clay is now armed and dangerous. Um, he's seeing stuff. Uh, there is uh, things going on inside the hangar at this point. He is seeing things. Um, uh, he is alone, and he is not. Uh, he's not afraid to to pop some caps off. He is he is firing weapons. And I can only imagine what uh, his neighbors thought and and the the rumor mill, right? The, the, the sewing circles and and the talk of uh, the UFO guy in the airplane hangar that's that that's got his rifle loaded and and it's it's just 
it's the heart of darkness. So um, you mentioned, uh, this is where I want to bring this up. You mentioned at the beginning of the show that, and I, 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 specifically about Clay, when you were interviewing him and, and speaking to him, and then he brings up uh, a buried a buried ET, right? Now, how, how tell us how that happened. <laughs> and, and what was it, Clay's demeanor, right? Now, you're playing the role of investigator, and right. I, I like, you know, uh, the skeptic uh, viewpoint on this. You don't want to go all in. Um, but what was his demeanor? Was he was he talking like a crazy person? Or was this something that just, uh, he seemed normal and he was just telling you his experience? He seemed like uh, an experiencer that I've come to um, uh, that I've come to understand that it's I, I've seen a pattern where when when somebody experiences something that is so beyond normal that it opens your mind and I think after for a while after that you're open to just about anything and it takes a while for you to come back to a point where you can start discerning things again and the person that I met in Clay was the person that was still open to everything because he had seen so many things that were beyond possibility that he had known before. How old and, was he? How old was he? Uh, he was, I think in his early fifties. Yeah. Early fifties. Young guy. Yeah. 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 Okay. But I mean, okay. he was, yeah, he, but he was, he was, um, by the time we met him, he was not well. Um, and as I said, he had deteriorated through the course of these events over three years. Some of them were caused by humans, his wife, uh, and others were, we don't know. Uh, and again, you know, we're hoping to find out with our investigation, is there something out there that's toxic or, you know, whatever. So, um, and to, to finish up that little story that I was talking about at the, before the break, uh, when he touched the bottom of that craft, that eyeglass case craft, it sprayed something on him and it caused burns throughout, uh, across his body. And um, the doctors supposedly were debating as to whether they were chemical burns or radiation burns. And I'm thinking, how do you get radiation burns from something that's sprayed on you? But the bottom line is this was yet another thing that, that, took away from his, his health. I mean, he was a strong strapping man before all this started and it just kind of went down. Yeah. Down but down. Uh, Fukushima water would, would cause radiation burns if you know what I mean. Right. You know, yeah, there was a radioactive chemical of, of some kind. So if, that, that yeah. makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So, um, um, but it's, it's funny that they had to debate over that though, that they didn't know the difference yeah, and I'm confused about that. And part of part of the investigate of the next phase of investigation will be hopefully we can find the doctors who saw him, and you know ask them why was there a debate? What were the symptoms that made you unsure? You know all those kinds of things. So it's now, so how then uh, uh, you jumped into the 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 the, the grave? Right? We've got a grave out there. How uh, well, what okay. happened? So so you. Yeah, so you jumped over to uh, right before the break to the fact that he was carrying guns all the time. He was armed and dangerous. So let me let me get you there so you can understand how he ended up being that guy. Uh, now he, he, to be honest, I mean he's a Texan. Uh, he had a lot of guns. We we that happens here, you know. Um, and um, but what had precipitated the buried alien was that um, there was an alien, a gray alien in the hangar one night and it was just him and either he was by himself or he was just with his secretary. Um, in the story, I say that he was with his secretary, uh, but there were a lot of these details I couldn't get 
from him because he was no longer with us by the time I wrote the book. So, uh, which is why the story is fictionalized based on the true stories. So, um, but there was this alien, this gray alien in the hangar and it shot a, he said it shot this blue beam out of what he called a breastplate. Um, so something on the chest of this alien shot out this blue energy beam, laser beam, something, but he said it cut through everything in its path and cut a hole in the outside of the hangar wall. So this is corrugated steel and it cut through that. And um, so after that happened, you know, before it was, it, it, it was scary, it was intimidating, but it was also fascinating. He wanted to know more. He wanted to communicate with the aliens. He wanted to know what they know. He wanted to go for a ride in their ship and see, you know, what's out there. So he was in a way like a little kid in a candy store, but then there was the, the scary parts, which you've described really well. Uh, and then it was it really upped the ante that night that it shot through everything in the hangar with this blue beam. So he knew not only could it kill him, it seemed to have that intention or at least to scare him. So now he is carrying weapons with him everywhere. He had a, uh, you know, uh, he had an AK-47 or an AR-15. He had a sidearm. He had, uh, I forget what gun he had on his workbench, but he was armed everywhere. And so um, by the time um, the second one showed up uh, and he had some, some of his employees were there at the time, uh, he shot it, but apparently didn't kill it. So the thing fell on the floor. He said it outgassed. And so they were all like choking and they didn't know, is this, you know, is this gas going to kill them? So they left. And uh, when they came back, he said, the, the alien was gone and there was this helmet thing. And he said, it wasn't like a motorcycle helmet or a, you know, NASA helmet. It was just like a skull cap kind of thing. You wouldn't even know that it was wearing a helmet except for this thing was on the ground. Uh, and he, he tried to convince himself that like the alien paramedics had come and taken, <laughs> taken this guy away. Cause he didn't want to think he killed it. He just knee jerk reacted because he knew they could be deadly now. And so, um, so now he has the helmet and he buried that. So now time passes and there's another alien in the shop and he's by himself and he shoots it and he kills it. And it doesn't outgas. It doesn't go anywhere. Nobody comes to get it. So um, he's got this alien body and what does he do with it? And, you know, he was, this was the hardest thing for me to get him to talk about. And I thought, you know, is it because he's making it up uh, or is there something else going on? And I think from the, the last few interviews that I did with him, it was really clear to me that he, he felt so bad about doing this. And in fact, the last interview that I, I did and, and I, I pushed him because I said, you know, my husband and I had to drive a long distance to go get there to interview him at the airport. And, and I, I wanted to get some answers from him. So I pushed him because uh, he'd always kind of squeeze out of it. Oh, I'll, I'll, uh, I wrote that down in a journal. I'll go find that journal or I'll write it up for you. It was always he was always diverting my attention from from those stories. <clears throat> and finally, I said. I pushed him in this one interview and he, he got up. I said, why do you want not want to talk about it? And he got up, he turned the camera off and uh, actually I don't, I think he turned the camera away from him and he, he walked out of the view of the camera and he said, you know, I'm afraid people are going to hear this and think I'm some kind of animal, you know? And, and at that point I realized that he, he was a man who felt like he murdered somebody 
And I said, you know, but the, but you were just defending yourself. If this was a bear, if a bear showed up in your apartment or showed up in your in your hangar, you would have shot it. And he said, uh, I'm not sure I would. So so I yeah, saw. But, that, but that's why the guns are there. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I don't I, I, look, I I. I understand the traumatic experience of of killing something. Doesn't right. matter if it's a squirrel, a deer, or, or a human. Uh, well, you know, I don't mind killing bugs, but <laughs> right. you know what I'm saying, right? right. You, you're affected by that. I totally get it. But that's what the guns are for. You know, well, they're coming yeah. into your your business. Exactly. And, 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 and you, you made that, what's the, um, what's the, uh, it's a, it's a crime of passion, right? Where yeah. you, you're in the moment, man. Pow. Right. I, and that's yeah. what, that's what he felt happened. Cause I said, you know, what made you shoot it? And he said, I was just, it was just reflex. I was scared. And, but, you know, even at the end, um, he told his mom, you know, mom, I really screwed up. I really wanted to communicate with them. I really wanted to know more. And, you know, I, I should have behaved differently. I should have reacted differently. I shouldn't have just led with the, with the weapons. But, what, is it, um, what, what about the local police? Um, they they've obviously have heard about his wife, uh, you know, firing yep. weapons out there. He's firing weapons out there. Right. Um, uh, did, were they were they ever on the scene, or uh, were they aware of the the alien uh, uh, component to this entire thing? You know, they had to be. Um, they had. I mean, they they knew about the shooting uh, that his wife did because they came and took her away, and then uh, they he dropped charges, and somehow or another, she was released. That's another story I need to look into. How how could that have happened? Um, but um, yeah, they knew stuff was going on. There were rumors around town. People, people knew he had these strange stories to tell. But I think they, I think they kind of wrote him off. Um, now, having said that, there were other people in the area who who saw ships, who saw craft, who saw strange things happening. And it wasn't confined just to the airport. Um, there's another kind of an ancillary story uh, involved. Uh, and, and it was with somebody who lived outside the airport, um, but still nearby. So which, which also leads my current team to wanting to know, could there have been something in the water? Could there be something in the air that was causing people's uh, you know, to causing people to hallucinate or to, to have behavioral changes or to, as Clay did, get sicker and sicker and sicker. He was the only one who lived there full time. So was there something about that place that um, was causing all this? Uh, let's not forget how it all started. You know, it was it, it had nothing to do with Clay. It was right. other people that were out front of of his business that were watching lights in the sky, right? And and I, I bring that up because now I want to get into the demonic side of this uh, next yeah. to as well because that's, that's a whole different thing. That's a whole different thing. <laughs> right. um, but uh, but I started off tonight because I when I started researching this case, um, uh, Clay was very clear in who he was at, at the start of this he you know he he wasn't a science fiction guy he didn't believe in it he, right. he wasn't any of that and and that's that's that that's this journey uh that he started to go on and at the yeah. end uh you know he he shoots an alien and and buries it in the backyard and uh so to speak and <laughs> right. that well, literally, right? Yeah, I guess he had an apartment there, so you can call it uh, uh, a backyard. And and the uh, uh, the location of this grave, I, I don't, you don't have to reveal it, but was it revealed to you? Yes. Okay. Um, obviously, this is a part of the investigation. Is right. 
is this something that the local authorities have to be involved in or or how how are you going to proceed and what are you, you know, going to do what are you going to do if you dig up an alien body <laughs> that's a good question i mean we have a, a biophysicist on the team who who has some has a protocol for you know what do you do and things like that so um you know as well as i do if law enforcement is involved and we actually dig up a body that's gone and it never was there and we are to talk about it you know so uh, it's now yeah you dropped out there for a second the only time tonight so yeah, I saw that. Back, back it up yeah back yeah. it up 10 seconds and repeat <laughs> okay so um you know, there's if if we do dig up a body uh, and law enforcement is involved, um, the body disappears and was never there, and we don't talk about it. You know. Um, you know what I do? You know what I? This is what I would do. Okay. All right. I, I'm not part of the team. I could be. I've already invited myself, by the way, earlier. You have, tonight, and, and, you're, and yeah. you're welcome. Yes. I would love. Is, <laughs> you you know what you do? You live stream it. Yeah. That's what you do. You live stream it. Don't You can video all day long. That stuff has a way of disappearing. Right. Live stream it. Right. Live stream it. Now, one of two things is going to happen, right? You're going to have the uh, Al Capone's vault. Right, and that's what I've been telling people. It <laughs> right, could, right. It yeah, yeah. You're, that. you're going to have Al Capone's vault or you're going to have King Tut's tomb. Right. It's going to be one or the other. Uh, it, it, there's no middle ground here. So uh, are you Geraldo, right, or not? And so I, I would just live stream it and 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 see what happens. Yeah. You know, and. Uh, that helmet thing, too, as well. Is right. that in the same grave site? It is in the same location, supposedly. If there's anything there. I mean, we, again, it could be Al Capone's vault. We could find absolutely nothing buried there. There could be empty boxes there. There could be, you know, a coyote body or, uh, you know, uh, who knows? It could be nothing. We don't know. Now, uh, I mentioned... Um, it, this is like, it's paranormal, it's supernatural and it's science fiction and it's, a, it's reality all wrapped up into one. Yeah. And when I was, uh, first made aware of the case, uh, the, you know, almost 10 years ago, it was, it was a while ago. Um, he describes, I don't know if this is in the book. I'm going to get your book. By the way, I haven't read the book. I didn't find out about the book until Michelle told me. Um, so I'm, I'm basing all of this on my memory and and my research into the case. But I remember uh, I remember Clay talking about these entities and and his confrontations with them and his his feeling that. Uh, that these weren't E.T., that this was something else altogether, uh, ghosts, demons, uh, angels, uh, spirits. Uh, but this started to to happen as well. And now, and I may have this wrong, but wasn't one like a, a, a blue glowing shape that, in the hangar? Uh, well, it was actually in his apartment. Right. Uh, and... I call it the plasma angel. Uh, right, 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 it, right, right. It looked, it was blue. You're right. You you, you have the right story. Um, it was late one night and he sees this glowing blue kind of a undulating, fluctuating thing. And he said that it, <laughs> he, he thought it was an angel. Um, but he noted that, well, it had brown hair. So, his idea of an angel was blonde. So he, that kind of stopped him. So kind of weird, weird little things that kind of humanize the story. But uh, he said there was this, this plasma being in the living room and he's trying to figure out what it is. And then as, as the moment evolves, there was another 
sort of energy being, plasma being, that came up through the floor. And of course, the, the floor is just a concrete slab, so nothing's coming up. But he said it was almost like a dark energy. And it was like it was trying to molest this angel. And so this, this event happened where it was almost like a play acting out good versus evil where this darkness comes up it's trying to molest this angel creature this angel being and she vanquishes the darkness and then it just kind of disappears so that i i, I don't even know what to call that there there isn't anything like that in any paranormal lore that i've ever heard of so i mean that it, it, one's just it, it, when when I got to that part of because it's a it's an accumulation of so many different things that that uh, went on with this case, and and I got to that part and I'm thinking to myself, um, uh, this this might be this might be somebody that has just gone over the edge, and right. when you and what. You don't know, you know, some type of schizophrenic situation where the it's real. Right. You don't know that. You, you know what I mean? This is this is real. Your mind is saying that this is real. Is it is it a situation like that, or is this actually going on in his apartment? Um, right. And I I felt that uh, it was. Uh, spirits, and I didn't feel, or d demonic, whatever you want to call an entity. That's what like he that. thought. Yeah, that's yeah. what he thought. But I don't know. I don't know if that was ET related. But then again, anything is possible, right? We don't know. Right. I mean, it's just I, I, I can't categorize it in any way. So I don't know what that means. And that kind of reminds me of another incident where he saw what he called an interdimensional portal. Now he's seeing that through, um, he had uh, eventually put up a camera on a tripod in the bedroom window that faced the runway. And there was a, a bus mirror angled so that the camera could see, it, the camera could see the view to the, to the runway, but it could also look down uh, the building, you know, down the length of the building. Yeah, past the mirror. And, Past it could look down to the hang through that you know the uh, the apartment to the hangar and then on to the rest of the uh the buildings on at the airport. And one night he said he saw and you know he's got pictures of what he said looked like and he could only describe it as an interdimensional dimensional portal. And he said it was like some force, like a magnetic force or some energy force that there was a, a row, there was like a stream of light and it seemed to be grabbing it and pulling this portal open. And then he said he watched it for about an hour and ships came out of it. There was a, a I call it a man walking wolf. So it was a, a, a wolf creature, but it walked on its hind legs. Um, and he said, you know, he watched this happening for, for an hour. And so, you know, as, as an investigator, I'm like, what the heck is that? I, I, I don't know how to describe that. And then he said, you know, when it closed up, um, he was getting ready to, to stop recording. And um, he, takes, he takes the camera outside to where this all happened. And he decides he's going to shoot some more footage just just to see if he can get anything up close and personal as opposed to from the window and, and with, you know, through that mirror. And so he just shoots some footage. And when he takes it back in to look at the footage, no, no, I think he looked at, at it right then, but he, it, this, I think this was one of those things he couldn't see with his na with the naked eye. And he sees what looked like, he said it was a, like it looked like the devil pushing itself out of the ground, pushing itself up out of the ground. He said it was red and slimy, wet. Mm. Uh, and it just, and it said it scared the crap out of him. And he grabbed the camera on the tripod, tripod ran into the house, locked everything up. And that was that for that situation. 
again, you don't find these things all together in the same place. And some of these things you don't find. I, I've never heard stories like this before. Hey, you mentioned earlier, um, uh, I want to circle back uh, uh, th th that uh, ships were going into the ground. Yeah. And and I, I, I recall, I could have this wrong, but one of uh, there were reports uh, outside of Clay Wheeler of of UFOs going into the ground and seen outside that were yes. independent of of Clay. Yes. Do do I have that accurate that yes. other people were reporting these ships going into the ground? Yes, in that same area, and then uh, like at a town twenty miles away as well. And that was happening uh, when we were uh, interviewing him. Uh, back in 2015. So, um, yeah, that was still going on. Uh, when you were interviewing uh, Clay, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, I can understand him not wanting to... I mean, if, if you're not talking... This is, this is the thing about experiencers, is that they hold it in because they don't want to talk about it and they they don't want to be ridiculed they don't want to be teased they don't want to be fired they don't want to be uh bullied in school whatever it is right you just don't talk about it with friends family co-workers you don't do it right. and then when when you do cross the line you're you're reticent about telling the whole story that's it right yeah. Um, and was he of clear mind? Do you feel that uh, that um, he wasn't crazy, that this wasn't some kind of deep-seated psychosis, uh, that this was the Clay Wheeler case? You know, this is, this is a really good question, Jimmy. Um, I found him to be very credible, but he himself... Um, you know, as a, as a story writer, there's something that you call the unreliable witness that he considered himself kind of an unreliable witness because um, he, he acknowledged that he would tell a story, an event, he would describe an event differently on different occasions. And if you, you could very easily just write that off and say, okay, he's just making it up and he's not consistent with his lies. Um, but he was literally on a lot of drugs. As time went on, he was on more drugs. So, and he was becoming weaker and weaker. So um, his, his memory had been damaged from all of that, all the, the trauma that he had been through, through the, sure. the, the medications he had been on. And uh, I mean, he had a clot the size of a, I think he said the size of a quarter in one of his lungs and he couldn't walk more than about 10 steps without, uh, you know, having to stop and catch his breath. This was by the time we were interviewing him. Um, so, you know, he was, he was getting sicker and sicker. So, um, you know, at the end of the book, I, I do go through my own as the skeptic questions. Was he lying? Was he exaggerating? Was he misinterpreting things? Um, you know, all of these things. And then, of course, there's a twist at the end, which you probably don't know, because I didn't find out until I talked to his mom, like a year after he died. And it just was sh so shocking that it made, you know, I call it the record scratch moment, because if ever there was a moment like that in this story, it was when I talked to her. No, let's uh, let's let's circle back to that. I, I need to respond to what, what you just said, though, uh, sure. in closing the book and asking these questions as a skeptic. I agree with everything that you just said. I do. And we have to squinty eyes. Right. You got to have right. those squinty eyes and get through this. But he says he shot an alien and buried it. Right. That's the twist. Of this. We're, now we're talking about uh, physical evidence and a claim Right, that 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 should be there, right, and and, and mm -hmm. evidence of it, and, and there better be a grave site. You know what I mean? But but that's 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 <laughs> the know. twist. But that's the twist in this this particular case. 
um, and, and the employees and the witnesses and his wife and the secretary and, and the neighbors and everything else that was going on there. It's not just Clay telling a story. There's right. a lot of players involved here. So right. I think that that's, that's the difference. you got to be a skeptic. I, right. I, I, I totally well, get it. But, man, and there's the, a lot going on. And then there is another twist. That, okay, so let's get back but to his mom. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what that is. <laughs> You what? have to read, have to read oh, the oh, book. Okay, I'm so <laughs> glad you just said that. I'm going to show you how good I am. <laughs> you want to give it five minutes? I, 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 you want to give it ten minutes? What? I bet in ten minutes you told me the whole story. Nope. That. <laughs> <laughs> you know how many guests? Uh, the, the the number is in the hundreds. That have said what you're saying right now. Okay. And I still got it out of them. Okay. But um, but but here's the thing. Why would um, uh, his mom uh, suddenly want to give something up uh, after her son has passed away? Well, she didn't know whether he had told me. So she. It was just one of those things throughout the book. There are many instances where Clay. He had this habit of saying, did I ever tell you about, you know, so the, his mom had one of those moments at the end of uh, at the end of my investigation, initial investigation, where uh, she was uh, we were we were just talking on the phone and uh, she had told me more about uh, a situation that happened when Clay was a kid. And they the family was on a uh, uh, family trip to they had driven to. Alaska, and they were on their way back. I think they were in Idaho, uh, and they had a travel trailer. And they just, they, the dad was too tired to uh, continue on to a, a proper stop, so they just pulled off to the side of the road at you know some wide spot. And uh, his mom said that in the middle of the night, she woke up and she heard what felt like voices, but didn't sound like voices. It was a, she said it, it was like a communication that was taking place in clicks, in a clicking sound. And um, she said, I knew right then that uh, it was aliens. She said, I was sure it was aliens. And she had never been interested in aliens and she wasn't interested in aliens after that. And in fact, when my brother co contacted her, uh, because he was trying to to make contact with Clay, and she, uh, somehow or another he he found her. Um, she was not happy that he was telling the story because it was so it had upset him so much, and it and it had deteriorated him so much. She was hoping to just like let's put this away and bury it. Um, so, and it was inter interesting when she was telling me about this clicking sound um, and she said it was going back and forth. So it was like one alien over here at one part of the travel trailer was click, click, click. And then another one over here was click, click, click. And they were having communication. And I said, hold on, I've got something that might be the same sound you're talking about. So my brother had a sizzle reel for his perspective TV reality show. And in it, his team is out in, uh, I think in Arizona, maybe Sedona. And, and um, they got this weird interference and it sounded, it didn't sound like any kind of audio interference I've ever heard. I've ever heard. Uh, but I played it for her and she said, yes, that's what it sounded like. For what it's worth, I don't know, but that was an interesting story. Mm -mm -mm. Now, your your brother, <laughs> um, as as he's going through this investigation, your brother passed away in 16, 15, 2015. Yeah, and in fact, it, uh, the anniversary is this weekend, the 9th. Um, he was actually uh, about to come out to Texas. He was making arrangements to bring a small film crew out to Texas to um, shoot interviews of clay and dig up whatever was there uh, and film it. Um, and 
middle of the night, I get a call from my niece and he had had a heart attack and died in his sleep. So, you know, that was just like, uh, you know, we were all stunned and I couldn't do anything. And in fact, Clay, um, you know, he said, my God, I just, I just talked to him. How can this be? And, and we were all stunned. And Clay and Jim had gotten really close throughout the course of their relationship. And, and in fact, they were like brothers. They would sometimes fight. And then, you know, I'm never going to talk to you again, or I hate your guts. And then the next time they're, they're back together. So um, in 2016, um, I felt like I needed to do something for, for my brother uh, for closure. I mean, his family was just so devastated. Uh, you know, his wife was just beyond um, broken. And so I made a, a memorial video uh, just to, you know, to celebrate Jim. And so I sent it out. I put it on Facebook and got it out to the people that he had contacted because he he knew people from all over the world. He had talked to experiencers all over the world. He was collecting their stories uh, and you know to tell them on his reality show if they were willing to to be on camera. And so I put it out there and um, and of course I sent it to Clay and I didn't hear back from him and I didn't hear back from him. And I thought, well, that's unusual because I, I know, I mean, he and I were in touch not, if not every day, uh, multiple times a week. And the fact that I didn't hear back from him was really strange. So, uh, cause I knew he would have said something, he would have commented on the video. And, um, so I uh, emailed his sister and said, you know, is he okay? And she said, um, no, he's in the hospital. He has multiple multiple organ failure and flesh-eating bacteria and if he survives they're going to have to remove large patches of skin and then the next day uh he passed away so what um, what happened to uh, uh, you know, where's all had, of his uh where's all of his footage well that's a part of the story that we kind of skipped over there was a raid um, by ATF, FBI, and three towns um, SWAT teams of his hangar. Uh, what what he told me was that um, they said that he had sent an email to all of his customers saying that he was going to kill them with an AK-47. Now, they they held him. They uh, interrogated him, uh, and I think it was for like eight hours. Um, he said he didn't get any phone calls. He didn't get any food, anything like that. And then they just let him go. But the story was that somebody had sent an email from his email address, his his work email address, that threatened his his clients to to shoot them. But in the end, he said there was there was no, no arrest. There was no warrant. They did take all of his computers. They took his files. They took his weapons and his ammo. Um, and I don't know what else they took. But ultimately, they returned everything. But he said when he got the computers back, a lot of his best uh, evidence, video, photographic evidence, was gone. So... Um, I don't know what to make of that. That that kind of goes back to your question about do I believe him? And in some ways I do, other ways I, I have questions, but every time I start asking a question and pursuing a way to, to discount what he told me, I hit a roadblock. It, it's, it, it happens every time. It's like, okay, well, what if he was doing this? Okay, yeah, but then there's this other thing that explains that. So as the skeptic, I'm ended, I've ended up with, I sincerely believe he had some extraordinary experiences. And um, regardless of the quality of his evidence, if he, if he never had any better evidence, um, 
I'm okay with that. And toward the end, I, I started telling him, forget, forget the photos, forget the videos. Just tell me what you experienced. Because to me, that was more compelling than anything else. And, and, and if you saw him, um, you know, I was interviewing him one time, he was out, you know, we've got the runway behind him. And I said, so overall, was would you say this was a negative or a positive experience? And he said, ah, it was a negative experience. But as soon as he said that, you could see his face change, his demeanor changed, and he gets this kind of a dreamy look. And he said, but you know, I kind of miss it. It was like, it was like being, being in the sci-fi channel every night, looking up at the stars and wondering what was going to happen. What was, you know, who was, who was going to show up and wanting to know who they are and, and what's out there. And so um, I, I could see that he, he was, he was genuinely um, fascinated by what was going on. And it wasn't just, it, 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 it could not have been because he was making it up. It had to be, if anything, that he was misinterpreting some things, but you don't misinterpret a ship that's clear as day and that other people can see. So uh, now, and, and for you, uh, did you go from a skeptic to the other side of the fence? Um, I'm still, I'm still the skeptic. I, but, but you want to say yes? I'm going to put uh, words in your mouth. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm uh, the molder. I, I want to believe. Um, I think that there. I think he's had some extraordinary experiences, and I think some of the things that were off the scale. I mean, some of the things I easily debunked, and and I worked with him to accept that debunking. Like he, he had pictures of. Uh, what he called rods, and your audience probably knows what I'm talking about, rods or skyfish, um, which I said, you know, this is easily debunked. Uh, here's this National Geographic or Discovery Channel video where uh, they they shot a cave opening at night uh, where they had a regular video camera and then a high-speed video camera and a timer in between. And so you could see that in the regular video, it looks like this long flying worm that has about 12 different wings on it. But on the high speed camera, it's a moth. And the problem is the, 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 the normal camera had such a slow shutter speed that it couldn't freeze the movement of that moth's wings moving. And so he resisted that a little bit. And I said, but we need, we need to debunk the things that we can debunk because I believe you had some really amazing experiences and I don't want to put stuff out there that people can easily disregard. I want to clear away the debris. And so he understood that and he appreciated, appreciated that. And then when we got home from that visit, uh, he sent me a picture of, of something that he, he had taken a picture of it and he called it the uh, I think it was the floating monkey head or, or, or something. And, uh, you know, he, he sent it to me again and he said, I, I've debunked that. Oh, uh, that was the, uh, wasn't it a sign? It was the back of a stop sign in right, the distance right. as right. he was. And he, and he saw it as he was driving away from the airport and um, he was taking a picture through the windshield. It was raining. So there was rain on the windshield. Uh, and so he, he was real proud of himself for debunking that. So I think he came to appreciate the value of trying to clear away the debris uh, so, that, so that people would come to appreciate what he really experienced. And so that's kind of what I came to. And in fact, it got almost to the point where the debris was all of his video and ph photographic evidence, in my opinion. Sure, uh, th sure. There are a couple of things that I think are interesting, but um, most of it, I would just say, forget all of that. Just listen to his stories.
Well, and now there's a list of things here that kind of need to get checked off. Is Has anybody reached out to you, any past employees? Are you going to do that? Uh, three, you know, if you have SWAT team and ATF and wh whatever, you know, doing a raid, uh, there has to be documentation uh, for all of that. Right. Um, and a list of the evidence that uh, they took and and what they kept and and what they returned. Um, uh, there's a, a long list of right. and, and and is there access to the stuff that they've kept? Is it is it locked up in an evidence room somewhere? That's a All really these, good question. Right, yeah. right. Um, has somebody reached out to you? And, and is, is no. there a way to track down the uh, the former employees? And there must be paperwork, ten ninety nines or something, right? W twos. Well, I uh, mean, um, those are all things that we're hoping to 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 go through in this new investigation. So there were some employees that uh, he said witnessed some things, but they don't want to talk to anybody about it. They don't want to, they completely don't want to even acknowledge that they were there, that they witnessed them. Uh, he said that the raid, um, they never filed charges and they said this never happened. So, but again, like you say, there's got to be a record of it. So that's yeah. on yeah. on my team to go and try to noodle through all of that uh, to see if we can find anything. You know, even if there's a strange absence of records, sometimes can, well, can tell yeah, you totally, happened. totally, yeah. totally, totally. And and also today, you know, 2023, we're in a different environment when it yeah. comes to the subject. And uh, it's not the funny, ha ha, you know, tinfoil hat situation that it was back in uh, 2013, 14, 15 yeah. with those employees. We're in a different environment now right. and people are uh, coming forward. And so hopefully that will be motivation uh, for for people to come and, and tell their story. There, It just seems that, well, when he says that uh, when he injured the, the first alien, right, and mm -hmm. everybody got gassed, right? Well, I, mm -hmm. th th there's witnesses there. Right. I mean, th aside right. from Clay. So yeah. hopefully we can get them to come forward and tell their part of the story. Right. And I have some names uh, and general locations of where they were when he last was in contact with them. So trying to track them down. Um, I don't know how easy or how, how hard that's going to be. If we find them, will they will they speak to us? Um, his mom saw some things. She saw a craft. She saw, and this is a part of the story that we haven't gotten into, but he believes that the, the runway lights were moving around. And his mom thought he's, you know, losing his mind until she saw something. And of course I'm talking to, I was talking to a MUFON guy and he said, you know, you and I both know those runway lights didn't pull themselves up out of the concrete pads that they're in and move around. But his mom, who was, she's the straightest arrow you'd ever want to meet. She wouldn't lie if her life depended on it. And she didn't, she thought he was losing it when he was talking about this until she saw it. And so the question we were asking ourselves is what would cause her to perceive seeing this? And so that brings us to the investigation. Could there be some kind of uh, gases coming out of the ground? Could there be something that causes something like heat shimmer that could distort the air uh, in a way that you could think you're seeing something that's stationary on the ground moving around in the air? So. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that we still need to investigate. And, you know, and that includes names of, of people who, uh, who, who supposedly witnessed some of these things. Um, you know, I've got a lot of leads about who I'd want to look into and, and try to find. Um, so how can you know, everybody gonna... reach out to you? If somebody's listening to the show and, and uh, uh, has witnessed something or is involved in this case, how, how can they reach out to you, Pat? Well, very easily they can reach me through experiencers.com um, because, you know, they can send me an email and, uh, and I'll, I'll respond uh, absolutely. Um, and, 
you know, I'd love to hear any stories. Uh, I, I just heard from somebody just today uh, on there and, and it's out of the blue. Nobody, hardly anybody has found experiencers.com and today uh, I heard from somebody. So I think that's a good sign that <laughs> people are, and I think, I think you're the magic, Jimmy. <laughs> well, you know, I do what I can uh, yes. to, support, to support everybody, you and the community. Um, and the links, uh, the link for experiencers.com is below. We've got it over on the website awesome. and, of course, uh, on social media as well. Well, keep us updated. And as for things sure. develop, uh, Pat, I would uh, love to have you back on the show. I'm going to order the book. Oh, yeah. Where can everybody order the book? Where's the best place to do that? Uh, it's on Amazon. You, it's uh, a paperback or uh, ebook. right now. We don't have a an audio book, which I've been asked for, but <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> audio books are easy. You yeah. just get, look, it, it, <laughs> it's, it, here's the trip about an audio book. And then uh, this, this will be my little parting message. You, you get an audio book of which I have audible. I've got a library right. that is insane. And they average five hours, eight hours, five hours, eight hours, summer, 10 Richard Dolan's got a couple of 16 hour books, but anyway, right. so at the far side of this 16 hours, that's two days. That's two, eight hour days of, of work. It doesn't take you a month to just go and get it done. Yeah. It's not I'm, like writing the book. The book is already written. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. We need to do that. Just, yeah, sure. just get it done. Audio books are great. Audio books. Yeah. Oh, I love uh, them. Absolutely. I, I cannot live without, I cannot sleep. I cannot sleep without audiobooks. Well, I, I usually end up if I get an audiobook I like, I usually end up buying a hard copy too. So. I, I do the same thing. I do yep. the same thing, uh, or vice versa. If I have a the hard copy, right, and I'm reading, I'm like, man, I'm gonna see if this is on audiobook. That's right. <laughs> oh, you know, one I I got just recently was Whitley Strieber's first, first book, Communion. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's out now he, again in in uh, audio. So, so. so he was um, I just talked to him uh, when when the audio version of Communion was released. You know, we did fade to black, and so that night I was very excited. Just got released that night. I ordered it, and this is what I did. And Whitley, I love you, brother. He knows I did this. <laughs> he it's read a little bit too slow. So I sped it up, you know, it's like that, <laughs> that, that, that first click, right. You can go yep. in, in increments, right. But that first click yep. and it was perfect. I was sitting there, I was, you know, I'm listening to him, I'm like, okay, all right. All right. No, no, it's too slow. Whitley, <laughs> you got to pick up the pace. And I, I clicked it and it was amazing. Oh, yeah. uh, I, to, I to love Whitley's right. books. Yeah, to have it read in his voice. Yeah, I gotta tell you, communion freaked me out. Oh, it, yeah. it did. It, it freaked everybody out. Yeah, to hear it in his own voice, man, that's whoo. That is a trip. That is a trip. But you got to do one click up. Right. At, that point one, one click up, and it's perfect. Pat, it, 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 go and and get, get <laughs> stuff done. Keep us posted. And if you want me to come out and live stream. I'm there. Okay. Well, I will definitely take you up on that. Oh, I'm not playing. I know. I'm not playing. Pat. Okay. All awesome. Right. Have a great night, Pat. Thank you, you so too. much. Thank you, Jimmy, so much. This has been fun. Perfect show. Thank you so much, Pat. And again, awesome. experiencers.com. The link is below. It's experiencers with an X. Uh, I want to remind everybody tomorrow night, I've got. Uh, Mark uh, Cowden with us now, uh, musician, journalist, music journalist, and went down that road. He did. And so tomorrow night we're going to talk about um, uh, the paranormal and his life's journey and some of the uh, creations and technology that he has put together to record the paranormal. So we're going to be doing all of that and much more tomorrow night with Mark Cowden. And I am going to get out of here. Everybody be safe. Have a great, fun, and amazing evening. And I'll see you right back here tomorrow night. This is Fade to Black, and Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Free. Thank you to Dennis and Kevin. Music, Doug Aldrich, intro, Space Boy. 
spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Mark Cowden, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.